some time ago, uh, I had uh, one in the congregation to ask me about animals. And uh, then Billy Graham came out with um, a little article in the paper that had to do about animals. Some uh, lady uh, had asked him if uh, her pet is going to be in heaven. And I believe he answered and said that God knows that our pets make us happy. And so therefore, uh, probably her little foo-foo will be there. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that is not true. Uh, animals are an important biblical subject. And they are important to our creation. In fact, man could not live in this planet if there were not animals. Man is the top of a life chain, uh, each part being essential to the wellness of the whole. So we're going to study about animals uh, today uh, in two places. First of all, in time, and then in eternity. Now, the reason that uh, I am going to include a little section on eternity is that, number one, even though animals do not go to heaven, there are some animals that were created just for heaven. Now, let me give you an example. Jesus Christ comes riding back to this planet on a white horse. Well, uh, that horse, I believe, was, has uh, existed ever since Jesus Christ made creation. Um, I don't know what the name of that horse is. It's probably not Trigger, uh, but, uh, but, it, but there's a horse that the Lord created just for him. It's his favorite riding horse, and uh, this um, horse will always exist. Now, the very first thing that we need to note is that though the Bible gives us some specific names of animals, there are about six categories here that um, are just general categories or general names for the animals. Now, for example, we have, uh, we have oxen mentioned, we have dogs mentioned, we have swine mentioned. Those are specific names. But they all come under these six general names for animals. Now, the very first one is found in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 20. Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that has life. Now, this moving creature is the Hebrew word charettes, which means wiggling swarms or teeming masses, or abundant breeders. In other words, when uh, these, uh, this particular species gets to reproducing, it reproduces millions upon millions of offspring uh, because there are bigger animals that feed off of these smaller animals and uh, the bigger animals have very large appetites. And so God created the charrettes, the wiggling swarms. When we talk about schools of fish, you always think uh, about uh, hundreds and thousands, even on into the millions of, of these small or smaller uh, fish that wiggle in the ocean. That's what it's talking about. The wiggling swarms that breed abundantly. Okay, now that's found in verse number 20. But now there is a second uh, word creature that is in uh, verse number 21 and God created great whales and every every living creature that moves which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind this time it is nephish and when nephish is used in uh, this context it's talking about intelligent life now, uh, in the oceans, which this particular word is directed there in this context, we're going to see another context in a moment. But um, in our oceans, uh, we have animated life and it more intelligent life. Now, let's take the shark and the dolphin. Probably the shark is not all that smart. It, uh, uh, it's simply a feeding machine. 
though uh, God has created it in an intelligent fashion to preserve the species, all it does basically is swim around and eat, swim around and eat. However, there is a species called the dolphin. And uh, the dolphin is so smart that uh, mankind is cracking the code of their, their language. They talk, they know, at least they're attempting to. And uh, so therefore it's more intelligent. The word nephish there uh, considers the broad spectrum of life that God created. Uh, so we find that not only does God create with regard to size, and form, God also creates for the purposes of, of explaining things in the angelic conflict, he also creates different levels of intelligence, even amongst the animals. Now, let's notice something um, I think is a kind of a neat observation in Genesis chapter nine. Genesis chapter 9, verse number 12, it says, This is the token of the covenant which is between me and you and every living nephesh that is with you for perpetual generations. Now, why do we point that out? Well, because the rainbow is not just for you and for me. It's not just for mankind. God made a covenant, the rainbow being the symbol of it, with intelligent life forms on this planet other than man. There it is right there in the context. So God has a viable relationship, not just with man, but also with animals. Animals, as we will see later on, can even praise God. and. Um, and uh, uh, appreciate God for the life that they have. Now, they're not saved, they can't be spiritual, but they didn't willfully sin. And so therefore, even though they're under the curse as man and as part of the creation, they still can have a relationship with God of sorts. And that's what this is pointing out. All right, let's turn to Leviticus chapter 11. For Two more uses of this word, nephish. Leviticus chapter 11, verse number 46. This is the law of the beast and the fowl and every living creature that moves in the waters and of every creature that creeps upon the earth. Now, the reason that I brought this verse out is that this word nephish is used not just for intelligent life in our waters, but also on the land. Both times nephish is uh, presented here as saying God made life in the waters. God made life for the land and it is intelligent life. Uh, now, we, we know that, we can appreciate that if uh, you are into purebred animals. I think it was 2020 that presented an expose about the uh, AKA, the certification of purebred, purebred dogs. And uh, they were actually mongrelizing them and then giving them a stamp of approval and a certificate that they were okay and selling them for high prices. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, some of those dogs are not as intelligent as others, and they breed them for the, the, and the pedigree guarantees that these dogs can obey their masters, understand commands, be taught more swiftly um, to obey and do the tricks and so forth. Uh, so the word nephish is very important. It enters into even things that we do today. Okay, now let's go back to uh, my nickname, Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter one, verse number 24.
where we have the word beast. How'd I get that nickname? It was in the school yearbook underneath my football picture. They used to call me the beast. Probably because I was like the behemoth, I had a ravenous appetite <laughs> rather than my football abilities, I don't know. Let the earth bring forth the living creatures after his kind, cattle, creeping things, and the beast of the earth after his kind. The behemoth, or into the English, the behemoth, the massive, large uh, uh, animal, the mastodons, the elephants, uh, the rhinoceros, and so forth, uh, the, the hippopotamus, that's the behemoth. It also can include um, uh, things like horses and cows and the like, and sometimes these particular words are, uh, are interchanged. But there it is used in, uh, in this particular context of God creating the larger animals as well. Now we know that uh, the whales were created. It says in verse number 21, the great whales that move, they're part of the charrettes, and of course they would be included in the nephish as well. They have a measure of intelligence, they can communicate and the like. Uh, but um, the word bahima seems to point toward animals that can walk on land. They are the massive animals. Job chapter 35. Job chapter 35 and verse number 11. Now I point out this verse here just simply to show you that the behemoths, these larger animals, can also be very intelligent. Uh, there's not a one of us here who has not gone to the circus and has seen the, the elephants perform. They, these massive beasts uh, are taught to obey and perform tricks. How do they know that? It's because they're very intelligent. Uh, we see the, their keepers interviewed and say, well, each has a personality of its own and, and they're tricksters and that sort of thing. They play practical jokes, uh, they spray water and the like. Well, in verse number 11 of Job 35, we're told that these particular creatures, the beasts here in verse 11, can teach us things. And that's why we can go through uh, the use of animals in the Bible and actually learn things. God created each animal to show us a virtue, a personality trait, uh, something of that nature that we can glean for ourselves. And we'll see those in just a little bit. Uh, well, good and bad things as well. We're going to see about the dog and the swine later on, what it teaches us. But we can learn from the animals. Okay, now let's, um, let's go back to Genesis chapter 1 again. Genesis chapter 1. And get the fourth name that's listed in the Bible for these animals. Okay? The fourth name is that of K, and it's seen in the beasts of the earth as we turn to Genesis 1 and verse number 30. Well, I, uh, yes. And uh, to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and everything that creeps upon the earth, I've given green herb for meat. This is the word K. And uh, it is an indication as well of, of a larger animal. And this particular word seems to associate it, seems to associate it with man, more of the land roving type. We're going to also see in just a little bit that this particular word is important when we come into eternity because there are some K's in eternity as well. 
They are strange looking creatures. Uh, it has the one head, but four faces. These K's do in eternity. One is the head of a man, or the face of a man, the face of an ox, the face of a lion, and the face of an eagle. And uh, this particular word is used, uh, indicating, of course, that they are larger, more powerful animals, just like the angels are considered God's creation, creatures, and they are larger and more powerful than man. That's why God created manna, uh, so that uh, he could just have it snow on heaven's ground. They can go out and collect it, eat all they want to the full. Okay, let's move here to the book of Romans. There is a fifth Bible word, Romans chapter 1. And that is the word creature. Tesis is the Greek word. Romans chapter 1, starting with verse number 23. And this word in the Greek indicates an original creature. Something as it came originally from the hand of God. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man, the birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Verse 25, they change the truth of God, in other words, what God is, into a lie, and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. In other words, they focused in on their animals more than they did upon God. Now, here's where I, I may step on a few toes and I don't want to. I like animals. I like pets. Uh, and growing up with, uh, with a dog and my grandmother had a parakeet and, um, and all of these uh, things would uh, go on. We were raised in a, a farm in the summer. Uh, sometimes would go out there. I'd stay with my cousins on, uh, on a farm owned by my great uncle. And uh, we enjoyed the animals. But there are those, particularly of the animal activist sort, who are doing just what this calls for. Don't kill the turkeys at Thanksgiving time. Well, let's all be vegetarians. And I want to tell you something. Ever since the dispensation of conscience ended, God allowed man to eat meat. And as long as I am alive on this planet, I'm going to eat it in one form or another. I may have to be off of the red meat just a little bit, but uh, the white meat is great. Now, that's what it is. It is an original creature. Now, we understand that of mutations and the like that have happened down through the course of the years. But basically, those creatures that were originally created at this point in, in eternal history are still with us today. Pretty much the very same form and fashion as they came from the hand of God. All right, now, let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4. Now the sixth word that is important to us is tisma. And it's mentioned as creature in verse number four. For every creature of God is good. Now here's where we get Pauline sanction to eat animals. Every creature of God is good. Nothing to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. So he's not saying you have to eat everything. Uh, and he's not saying that all things are good for you. But if there's nothing else to eat and it's set in front of you, pray over it and have at it. Tisma means an established life form. Every creature of God. Tisma, every established category of life. Of course, man is not good to eat. You wouldn't like to, um, to eat any part of me because... Uh, my mom always said I was spoiled, so that, that protects me. 
but an established life form. All of these are essential in understanding the doctrine of animals. All right, now, let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. Because of my time this morning and space, uh, this is quite a lengthy outline. I did not have time to put the uh, Bible verses uh, alongside of these, but we'll take our time as we meander through animals in time. Now, let me qualify this statement just a little bit. What do I mean by animals in time? We here, at least uh, I am, believe uh, in uh, the gap theory. We're, we are gap theorists. Now, I don't like to use the word theory because they, they say you can't prove it. That is absolute nonsense. You can, you can prove that the earth is very, very old and that man is a very, very recent creation to the earth and that man was created subsequently to the angels who were originally created. Now, the point that I want to make here is that the animals in time go back from where we are now to the original six days of creation. There were animals before that. They are known as the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs, which are animals, originally existed before Adam and were not part of the recreation of God in Genesis chapter 1. Now, the, uh, the modern, this is something that, that I fear. Now, please uh, don't uh, react to this or think that I'm some sort of fanatic. But the modern, modern resurgence of the um, favored status of the dinosaurs with, uh, with generations going after it. We think of uh, uh, Jurassic Park, even Barney. So why are they so popular? Because originally on earth, Lucifer's battalion had these as their pets. And uh, they, they were, they're the pets of fallen angels. And I believe that um, sometimes, not all, not all of it, uh, but sometimes the resurgence in its popularity is because uh, these ancient creatures were part of Lucifer's planet that God destroyed by sending Lucifer here and blowing it up. Okay, where are we? God created all animals. Verse number 20. Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures. Who said this? God did. Verse 21. And God created the great whales and every living creature, uh, every uh, fowl, winged fowl, after its kind, and God saw that it was good. He created this part on the fifth day, says verse number 23. God created everything. Verse 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle, creeping thing, everything after his kind. God made the beast of the earth, the cattle after their kind, every creeping thing after his kind. And God saw that it was good. So the point that we're making is that God is the one who created all animals. Now, let's stop right there and take one of the arguments for the existence of God. The biological argument. Now there are several arguments. Uh, it's called the teleological argument the design, the cosmological argument, the fact that there's material here, and on and on we could go. But the fact that there is life on this planet is a biological argument for God. Well, what do we mean? What does biology say to us? Life must come from life. And so therefore the biological argument tells us that there is a God uh, because we can trace him from our existence all the way back to the lowest life form and we still have to say, well, who made the lowest life form? Who created it? Who, who brought it into existence? And of course the Bible declares time and again, it was God. 
How did you get here? Well, if you trace it all the way back, there had to be some form of life existing, some form of intelligent life existing uh, so that you could have organized life uh, and a body that functions and a soul and so forth. And the only explanation to the biological argument that life comes from life means that there has to be a God and the animals prove that. Okay. Now, I want you to see uh, verse number 23. It says that God created certain ones on the fifth day. And then verse number 31 of Genesis 1. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good in the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Okay. What's the significance here of these two things? God created the envelope of life to feed another type of life in the first four days. But there were two days, and the significance has to do with their numerical value. On the fifth day, five is the number of grace. Now, between four, which is the number of the earth and creation, and six, which is the number of man and the day in which he was created, there was something else created to enable man to live. What was that? All of these forms of life. The lower forms of life that provide that life chain all the way up to man. Because without these other animals, man could not live. Why did God do that? It was an act of his grace. That's why on the fifth day, these were created. Now, the sixth day has to do with man and his labor. Uh, God worked six days and then he rested. Later on, it says that uh, in the, the Ten Commandments that you were, to you were to work for six days and then rest. And it even makes a stipulation for the animals. The animals were also to rest on the seventh day with man. Now, what, uh, what is the sixth day? The sixth day has to do with man's labor. And the fact that God has provided man a means of promoting himself legitimately and prospering himself legitimately, legitimately with the bigger animals that were created on the sixth day. Uh, after all, uh, tractors are just a modern <laughs> convenience. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't have tractors just a few short years ago, relatively speaking. How did man raise his crops? How did he till the ground? He harnessed the power of the animals. How did he travel? Okay, that's why the, these bigger animals are, are noted and mentioned as coming into existence on the sixth day, the day of man and his labor. So uh, we can learn uh, as far as animals are concerned that God in his grace provided this chain of life on the fifth day. On the sixth day, he provided not only man, but man's means of working to advance himself beyond his own limited physical capabilities by harnessing the power of, of the animals. Now, by the way, uh, we could call ourselves, in this sense, a very similar, uh, we, we could say that we are in a very similar situation to the animals. Here is Adam, and he had vast capabilities. But in order that Adam might promote himself, he harnessed the power of animals. Okay, here is God. In order that God might advance and prosper his glory in the universe, who does he harness? Us. See, it extends his prosperity. He shares with us his glory, but in, in essence, it reflects back to him. And that's the very same thing with regard to the animals. Th these are all teaching tools, visual aids. Uh, in, in, well, I should say audio and visual aids. What meaneth the bleeding of the sheep? Uh, well, audio visual aids in order for us to learn that God set man here over the animals as God is over man. And what man can do with the animals in prospering himself and promoting himself, God can do with man. All right. Now let's, let's learn a, a third thing. 
just before we go down and have something to eat. Genesis chapter 1, uh, starting with verse number 29. Originally, God created both man and animals herbivores. Now, what does that mean? Simply, plant eaters. I wonder if they had some craft French light there for their salads. Okay, just, I was, I was reminded of that with regard to, we were talking about a work day and involving Max. And there are some of us who will do work and some of us who will do work light and Mac would, Max will do the work light. Okay, verse 29. God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, every tree, uh, the fruit of the tree yielding seed, it shall be to you for meat. So, those of you who like fruit, uh, <laughs> You're introduced to that through the original creation. Verse 30, to every beast of the earth, every fowl of the air, everything that creeps on the ground, wherein there is life, I have given the green herb for meat, and it was so. Animals did not eat other animals in the original creation as, as such, as far as the bigger animals especially. And man did not eat animals. He was put in the garden to till the ground and to keep the garden. So fruit, fruits and vegetables were to be his diet. And by the way, if you want to have, they say, a healthy heart and live a long life in, in this um, time, what are the nutritionists telling us to do? Go back to fruits and vegetables the way that it was originally created. Now, uh, I'm going to have a hard time doing that, but... Uh, we, we can still eat the white meat in this dispensation. Okay, uh, let's go to one, one more point here. We've got one more minute and, and bring this together. Verse number one of Genesis chapter three. Point number four is that God created all animals with varied intelligence. Now, one of the reasons that he does this is to teach man and angels with regard to capabilities. We learn real, we've learned real fast, hopefully, uh, since the dawn of creation here that there are certain animals that can do certain things. And to try to make these animals do things that they were not created for, that they have no capacity for, only serves to hurt the animals. Now, what, uh, what does this teach with regard to the angelic conflict? Lucifer was an original creation. Lucifer has a phenomenal intellect. He, his mental prowess is beyond belief as far as the way he was originally created. But there's one thing that Lucifer cannot be, and that is God. And as much as Lucifer wants to think he can be God, he can't be God, he's beyond his capacity. And if you are ever promoted beyond your capacity, you can never have happiness. Now that's the point here with the animals. You can only do what the, uh, with that animal uh, with regard to what capacity he has. So God created all animals with varied intelligences. Uh, why? Simply to teach us that, that you have to stay within your own capacity. Um, we had our Sunday school superintendent uh, uh, to give us the point. We all look out there and say, oh boy, these people out there, they're unsaved and, and they don't have to go to church on Sunday. And boy, they seem to be having a good time and they seem to get all the promotions. And, they, uh, and I want to say, yes, but if they were promoted in, in an improper way, they're not happy. They have all these things, but they're living beyond their capacity. 
And who knows how jealous they are, how envious they are, how petty they are, how vindictive they are. We even have uh, people in the highest offices that are still greedy and, uh, and, and petty and jealous. What does that say? Well, they might have gotten to that office, but if they didn't have the capacity, they're not happy. And that's the point. You can only use that animal with respect to the capacity that he has. To push it beyond its capacity is to harm the animal. You'll punish it. It wants to please you, but it simply can't. It doesn't have the capacity, the capability. So here, here we are, verse 1. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. The subtlety there indicates capabilities of mentality beyond the other animals. There is not only a life change in size, there is a life change in mentality and intelligence than any beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Now, uh, the two points here, just very quickly. Animals only started eating other animals in relation to the fall of man. And any time you have sin, what do you have to do? You have to start devouring one another. You have to start make, having might to make right. It's a survival of the fittest rather than having an ordered society uh, um, that protects one another and looks out for one another. That's why God had them to eat the herbs. But after sin and relation to the fall, Animals started eating other animals simply because when you have sin to enter the universe, you must start feeding off of one another. You must, you must make yourself stronger than your prey in order to survive. And the very same thing with regard to the intelligence. Uh, you must utilize the intelligence that, that you have to survive the way God created you and not go beyond that point.